Hello, my name is Beth Lincoln. I'm a family nurse practitioner, and today I'd like to talk to you about the COVID-19 virus. I'd like to give you some information and, and provide some guidelines for what we can do to not only protect ourselves, but to know when we should call our doctor and if we're caring for another individual. So let's look at the coronavirus. Actually, it's been around since the early 1960s. Um, some examples of the coronavirus would be the common cold or measles or SARS. So there's different versions. When we look at COVID-19, it stands for coronavirus disease. It's a new coronavirus. It's one we haven't seen before. And it's also called coronavirus just because of the crown-like spikes that are there. So this is a brand new virus that we've just discovered. How is it transmitted? It's transmitted from contaminated surfaces that we happen to go and touch. And then what, what do a lot of us do? We take our hands and we touch our face. So it's that hand to face being your mouth, your nose, your eyes, and that contact. Another way of getting it is if we are in close proximity, that means less than six feet from, and probably closer to three feet from, another individual who might be symptomatic of the virus or not have symptoms at all, but be in that closed environment for at least 15 to 30 minutes. The other way is the infected droplets, that when someone coughs, or sneezes, and we are within close proximity. For example, less than six feet. If we are within three feet of them, we are much like, more likely to get it on our clothes, on our person, or even on the areas surrounding that individual that we would then happen to touch and do hand to face. So that's how it's transmitted. And how do I protect myself? We've heard a lot about this in the news and it, and it really does make sense. It's very easy to do, um, but it's changing a lot of our previous habits that we've not done before. So we talked about hand washing and when we're talking about hand washing with soap, we're looking at washing our hands for at least 20 seconds. I remember learning this when I went to a, a, a seminar that the uh, Nava Public Health Department put on and, and they asked us to sing happy birthday twice. And that was at least 20 seconds worth. The other thing is we can always use sanitizers. Um, ever, after we've touched something, then we can just use the sanitizers. It's very easy, especially if we're out in the community. You wanna make sure that there's at least 60, 70% alcohol within this um, sanitizer. The second is social distancing. Keeping six feet apart from the, when we're out in that public arena. And then lastly, if we are coughing or sneezing, we take that tissue, we use it to cover our mouth and our nose, and then we throw the tissue into the trash. So the three ways are hand washing, social distance, and of course using something to cover our nose and our mouth when we are sneezing or coughing. Now the next thing I want to talk about is masks. Masks have been really receiving a lot of attention lately. When do we use them? Why would we use them? If you look at the one over on the left, that's that N95 mask. And why would we use that? Well, we in the general public wouldn't have a need for it. I was listening to a podcast by a physician who's an ICU, a doctor in um, New York at Cornell who who deals with the coronavirus patient every day. He says that for himself, he uses it when he's in the patient room and using it when he's in close contact with that person. For example, if they're on a ventilator and he's taking them off the ventilator, the chances of that person coughing and coughing up mucus is very high and being projectile or if he's doing a breathing treatment with someone, he says those are the times you want that N95. He said because it blocks those droplets, those large droplets and the small ones, so that he doesn't get infected. The middle one is what we call a surgical mask, and he said that's generally what he uses 
when he's in the hospital setting, keeping his face covered like that, and generally that that is a good protective barrier, even when he's seeing um, some patients, but not doing any procedures. The last one is the uh, cloth mask that a lot of sewers and quilters are making around the country. And of what benefit and of what protection are they? They offer a little bit of both. What a cloth mask does for those of us in the general public now, we're not the healthcare providers, we're just out in the public. When you wear the cloth mask, it does several things. One, it reminds you not to put your hand to your face. So if I'm out in the public and I'm at the grocery store or I'm in an elevator going down in a building and I'm touching things or I'm signing the little visa thing at the store that everybody else has touched as well, then I know that if I went to touch my face, I wouldn't get to my mouth, my nose, or my eyes. So it offers that kind of protection. Secondly, it sends a message to everybody around me. We're doing social distancing. It's a reminder. And lastly, too, that if, if you have a bit of a cough or something, it protects the person around you from you so that there are three different types of masks. And what he recommends is, yes, the first one is in that hospital setting along with the second. And then he recommends that the community use those masks because if we look back at transmission, it's mainly hand to mouth, to nose, to eyes. It protects us, it stops us. Okay, so what are the symptoms that I should look for? I think we've also heard a lot of information about this too. Symptoms can range from mild to severe. You have a cough, but generally it's a dry cough what we call in the health profession as a non-productive cough. In other words, you're not bringing up mucus. It's very dry. A fever. The fever usually lasts for one, two, three, four days, usually three or four days. It's usually high, above 100 degrees. Usually you have body aches and fatigue. Very similar to flu-like symptoms. The one difference is that sometimes this leads to some shortness of breath. And what do I mean by shortness of breath? It's when you get up in the night to go use the restroom and you're very short of breath just doing that one activity. Or you get up in the morning for your coffee or your tea and you feel short of breath just walking from the bedroom to the kitchen. So that's a very important thing to recognize. So when do you call your doctor? Well, you can call your doctor when you have concerns that you might have the virus, but you're not sure. Now, a lot of offices are now doing telemedicine. I know that's what we're doing in our office and that you can call in and have this conversation with your healthcare provider and it will provide you with information and some reassurance. Secondly, you wanna call if you're running a fever. It's very important, especially if it's lasted more than one day. Shortness of breath, any shortness of breath. This is what I used to say to my patients. Shortness of breath is when you've crossed the line. That's when you really need to be proactive, call your physician and or go to the hospital. So that's key here. One of the things that the physician said about shortness of breath and people who come to the ER, that's generally what usually brings them in, that and the fever. He says of the 80% um, of us generally will have mild symptoms, 80 to 90%, but some of us may have more significant, again, the shortness of breath. He said there's about 10% of those of us who get it will need to go to the hospital. And of those 10% of us that need to go to the hospital, one to 3% may need to be in the intensive care unit and on a ventilator. So when you do have shortness of breath, that is the impetus again to call your physician. But what if we're caring for someone at home? What do we need to know here? 
for caring for someone at home, we want to prevent the spread. So if we can provide a separate bedroom, a separate bathroom, not use the same personal items as that individual, wearing a mask around that individual, because again, if we're wearing a mask, any area that they have touched that we happen to touch because we're cleaning up behind them, we're not touching our face, our nose, our mouth, or our eyes. Wash your hands often or use the hand sanitizer. I can't, I can't say it enough. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. And clean the surfaces that are touched. Very key. So when can you stop your isolation? Or your, or your family member's isolation. First, if there's no fever for at, le at least 72 hours, and that means no fever without using medication to bring the fever down. And another important informational tip here is, and this doctor pointed it out, and there's also been some other studies done, to avoid using ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is the same as Motrim, it's the same as Advil. Um, it has some detrimental effects. So what you want to use is Tylenol, okay? So no fever for at least 72 hours without using any medicine, that the other symptoms seem to be improving, and that at least seven days have passed since your symptoms first appeared. So take that as a total picture here. And then again, when you're out in the public, you know, be aware of the social distancing, using your sanitizer. Like I said, a mask is a good way to create the awareness. At the same time, avoid touching your face. So I appreciate you taking time to watch the video. I, I'm, I'm thinking that together we have this knowledge and together we can keep each other safe and we can keep each other healthy and that we will get through this together. Thank you for your time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.